right? All right, good. We like seeing new faces, but we also want you to come back. Um, so one suggestion is for Talk of the Hill with Bill Press and Alexandra Petrie, what have you say, <laughs> um, at the end of the month. Um, so you can come back for that. Um, just a few reminders to silence your cell phones. Um, and we also have um, little cute uh, note cards for you on your, um, on your seats with those little golf pencils so you can write down your questions for us and we'll collect them throughout the program for our Q&A. Um, so I'll just turn it over so you can give a round of applause to journalist Tom Sherwood and DC Council Member at Large, Alyssa Silverman. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Don't go too far. Well, thanks everyone for coming tonight. And thank you to the Hill Center. Can you hear me okay with this microphone? I need someone to hold it for me. <clears throat> Mark Seagraves, as you can tell, is not here. You can't either see him or hear him. He's sick. He called me last night, said he'd called out at Channel 4 to, from work today, so he didn't feel like he could come today. He's still sick. And I have some kind of allergy, so I sound funnier than normal. Now, for any, has, has anyone else been to one of these Hill, all politics is local events here? You know, okay, good. The whole point of this program is to get to know better the person, the public official who serves us, whether elected or appointed or dragged into service. It's not so much what they've done, what they've introduced, what they promoted, but who are they? Now recently, just before he died, former President George Herbert Walker Bush, his historian John Meacham, who gave the eulogy, a great eulogy if you saw it at the National Cathedral, Meacham went to see Bush to read him what he was going to say. And after Meacham read President Bush what he was going to say, President Bush said, that's a lot about me, John. I thought that was funny. Please welcome at large council member Alyssa Silverman tonight. Tonight is a lot about her. So, I'm, I'm amazed that any of you showed up for this. So thank you for don't coming. Don't be modest. The first question is, let us see where is, I can't read this far. When and why did you take up balloon yeah. dog things? These are great. Actually, these are the right balloons. Um, so first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. She's um, already avoiding the first question. Um, Here, I'll so, open them for you because do well, you blow I, them up yourself? Well, you need a pump, actually. You need the right equipment. Maybe somebody in the audience. If I knew you were going to do this, Tom, I would have been happy to bring my equipment with me. So for those who don't know, um, I uh, am an amateur balloon artist. Um, and the reason I took it up is because... Um, when? Uh, I'd say about two years ago. Um, so often I present ideas to my staff, and sometimes they're met with a little skepticism. Um, and um, the true story is that um, I had an old boyfriend who uh, was a balloon artist, and it was like magic. So he would just set up shop at, like, I remember in front of the Lincoln Memorial, and it was like a, a child magnet. Uh, and when we, when we go and do community engagement, um, I often found that it was um, a little boring to just talk about public policy all the time. Uh, and I thought making balloon animals would uh, be fun for the kids, uh, memorable. Uh, there are going to be voters one day. So they'll walk away with something tangible from me that they enjoy, bring a little joy into their life. And also perhaps their parents might be a little captive while we're making the, I'm making the balloon animals so that we can talk to them about paid family leave, for example. Can you do it while you're talking? So if we had somebody in the back blow up a couple of these balloons, you could you could twist them into something recognizable. So I, if somebody has the lungs to do it, um, can you just stretch them? <laughs> you you uh, these are actually a special type of balloon that you really need a uh, balloon pump for. 
I wasn't going to pay the money for the handheld balloon pump. Yeah, the pumps eight dollars. Those were expensive um, enough. That's not. That's a de minimis gift, though. It's thank so under twenty five. Thank you very much. These are the correct kind of uh, balloons. These are good. I'll see uh, I will be happy to make you a dog, or I, I need to expand my repertoire actually. So I'm very good with. Uh, What's your dogs. favorite animal? Well, of course, a cat. Okay, we, we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> okay, let's go talk about you some more. That's enough about okay. the damn balloons. So your early years, you're not from Baltimore, as a lot of people think. You're from New York. Is that correct? I was born in New York, but I think that I, means I, you're I, from I was New from Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore in that I grew up there from five, but I'm not a Baltimorean because Baltimoreans were born in Baltimore. So where were you born? Uh, Westchester, New York. So you're from New York. Yes. I was born in New York. I thought I was right. You're but in the campaign, in I think it was uh, an issue that I yes, was from I Baltimore. Yes, I right. All right. So you're, you you live there. Your father was laid off. I'm not sure exactly the time level here. I'm just trying to summarize this so you don't take all the time talking about it. <clears throat> your father was laid off. His fa your father, Jack. The family moved to Baltimore, even though then he commuted for nearly 40 years to D.C. for a federal job. Why Baltimore? Why didn't you move to D.C.? That's a question that my brother and I have been pondering for 40 years. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it was the same reason why a lot of people make the commute now. Um, the cost of housing is less expensive. So that my, my father um, got a job in Baltimore. And excuse me, for, uh, the way this is set up, you no, have to periodically look? look to the right oh, where yeah. Sharon is. This is bad politics. And also, you have to look <laughs> over here. I'm leaning okay. back, almost falling out of my chair thank so you. they can see you. Thank you for but, the pro but, tips. All right, but go back um, to the program. Thank you. My apologies to everyone to my right. Uh, so my father uh, got a job in Baltimore. The job didn't work out. Can you uh, tell us what it was? He's a lawyer. Uh, yeah. So it was, <laughs> should we move on? Yeah. Um, but my, my dad uh, just retired after uh, 40 years of federal service, but he was a pioneer. Uh, he commuted from Baltimore to Washington on the Mark train every day uh, from 1980 till five years ago. And he had some years of federal service before that. Uh, but they made the decision to stay in Baltimore, to keep their house in Baltimore. Um, where they the still live. History, where, yes. And what did your mother Ruth do? Did she have a job there? What did she do? So my, my, my mom worked part time. Um, she worked some retail jobs. She worked for a nonprofit. Um, also took care of my brother and I, which is a full-time job. That's true. We'll get to your brother, Jonathan, when we talk about your campaign. Oh, wow. I watched some of these other ones, and there wasn't – this was a different line of questioning. <laughs> I did my research. Where's the softball You have to do ones? research on your brother, Jonathan? <laughs> no, I did say I watched some of these other um, – uh, uh, conversations. So what year did you graduate from high school in Baltimore? 1990. Some of the older people in here are going, ooh. <laughs> but, okay, um, so you went to Brown University. Why? And what did you study? What did you graduate in? Uh, so actually... Did you graduate? Maybe I should assume something. <laughs> you pause there. Well, there, so there, it was a little bit of a circuitous route to Brown. Uh, I initially went to the University of Michigan, uh, and I had no idea uh, that it was that large a school, which might show you that the uh, college counseling at my public high school wasn't so great. Uh, I went there. I was overwhelmed. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I felt lost, as I think a lot of people often do at a large public university. And so everyone that I was friends with at Michigan kept talking about the school Brown, Brown, Brown. I didn't really know what Brown was. Uh, I hadn't applied to it, but I thought, okay, well, the, the people I like at Michigan like this school, and I hear it's smaller, then maybe that's the right fit for me. So I ended up at Brown. And you graduated? What year? Uh, I graduated in 1995. How did you get to D.C.? Uh, I got a job after college with the New Republic magazine. Was it An internship. Quite liberal magazine at the time, right? No, actually, Andrew Sullivan uh, was the editor at the time. So it was going through quite a transitional phase. 
And in fact, anyone who knows the magazine, I was, I was an intern along with Stephen Glass, the infamous yes. plagiarist. If that's his real name. <laughs> so, uh, and your first job in town was at the New Republic. What was your second job? In DC. You moved somewhere else? Yes. Oh, so yeah. I, uh, I was an intern at the New Republic magazine. That ended, and I actually moved back to Providence, Rhode Island. Hello, this side of the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm following Tom's orders here. Uh, so I moved back to Providence, Rhode Island, and I worked for an alternative weekly like the city paper there called the Providence Phoenix. Some of you from the Boston area might know the Boston Phoenix. Of course, these are all uh, relics of the past now. I, I think the Phoenix companies went under. Okay. Uh, I have a question for the audience. Are you a dog person or a cat person? Come on, let's get those hands up, cat people. <laughs> and, and yeah, and, oh, neither. How about both? Who is a red wine person? Okay, you say that one condition of working in your office, and I'm sure it's facetious, but you said that one condition is you have to be a cat person to work in your office. Don't know if that's true or not, but I hope it's not. Um, you say your best friend, I'm not sure I can pronounce it, is Auslan, Auslan or Uslan? Usman. U Usman. Yes, my cat. I misspelled it. That's your cat. Tell us something about Usman and why he has that name. So, like really, thank you guys again for coming to this. <laughs> so I have a great cat story, actually. So I grew up with Not cat. a long one. I, I, I've been very short with my answers. You have to admit that. I'm judging. Um, so I grew up in a, a cat household. And um, when I went to adopt a cat in, in D.C., I was living on the hill, on, actually on the southeast side of the hill. I went to, the, to Worrell. Uh, the Washington Animal Rescue League, and there was a cat there uh, uh, who seemed very friendly with a couple, and I thought they were adopting the cat. And then, uh, you know, we struck up a conversation. It turns out that they were the neighbor of a woman who lived on the hill for a very long time, uh, and I think there might have been a dispute between the couple about adopting the cat. They were very close to the cat. I think maybe the husband wanted to adopt and the cat and the uh, wife thought they had too many pets already. Um, so I adopted that cat, Usman. And then about a year later, um, I got an email from the nephew of, the for of, my, of Usman's former owner asking for my legal address. And uh, so yeah, I should fill, I'm, should fill in a few more details. So the couple that, um, was at Worrell connecting me to the family and they would send some gifts for Uzi and things like that. And so I thought, oh, maybe they're sending me a Christmas card. Uh, well, in the mail came a legal size envelope um, of the uh, former owner's will that Usman was named in her will and he had a little trust fund. <laughs> um, which any pet owner knows is really helpful when it comes to uh, vet visits. So in fact, uh, she was a really cool lady. Um, she lived on the hill. I think he was, uh, so Uz, if you look up Usman, it's the name of a lot of North African soccer players and despots, I think. Um, so I think she was in the Foreign Service. Uh, she sold, they, her family sold the house and in her will she had the money go to four civil rights organizations and she had three cats and she gave each of the owners a little trust fund to take care of the cats. Is the trust fund done? It was done with like two vet visits. So. <laughs> 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 Though I go to the vet right across the street at Capitol Hill Veterinary Clinic. Very nice vets. Okay. Both named Murphy, if anyone else takes there. There are two Dr. Murphys there. We're going to get into your policy. You work for the city paper. As well, let's talk about balloons more. <laughs> you may want to. Um, we're not going to go just chronologically through your life, so I'm just going to move around to talk. In, in the course of working here and being in the Washington and being active in all the jobs you've had in the Fiscal Policy Institute and others, 
you've had mentors. You say Kathy Patterson, who's currently the DC auditor, is one of your mentors, if not the leading mentor in your life. How did you meet, I think most people in this room know of Kathy Patterson, former Ward 3 council member, I think three terms, ran for chairman. You don't have to applaud her, she'll be, her head's big enough. Anyway, so. This I is, think there's some friends she'll love of that. Kathy she'll, and She'll the just like row. the fact that I mentioned her. Okay, how did you meet Kathy Patterson and why is she a mentor? Uh, well, I met Kathy when I was a reporter for the city paper. Uh, I was the Loose Lips reporter. Uh, and this was during the second you can give some dates that would be great. Second Williams administration, 2002 to 2004. Um, so I covered Kathy as a reporter, and I was just really impressed uh, with Kathy's approach to the job. She was always very thorough, uh, always very knowledgeable about uh, the public policy area that she, um, Exam, you know that that she was examining. Um, I, she was a former reporter, so I think we had a, a automatic rapport there. Uh, and I just had a lot of respect for her approach to being a council member, and we remained friends after I left reporting. And do you consult her even now for various issues? We just had drinks at the Chevy Chase Lounge, um, very uh, a few nights ago. Good that you can remember it. Um, <laughs> Mary Che. Ward now, 3 visibility <laughs> is very important, Tom. Um, this is too weighted to Ward 3, but I'm going in the order of what you've said in the past. Mary Che, who is your seatmate, you have said you are jealous of her legal expertise. <laughs> uh, so I'm not a lawyer. Uh, as I mentioned, my father is a lawyer. My brother is a lawyer. Um, and when I grew up, I thought there were only a few career avenues, doctor, lawyer, business owner. Those were the only three things I thought you could do in life. Um, so uh, I, I think I have some, uh, what would you say? Um, Envy? Maybe, or, you know, I, I, uh, I am envious of, of the legal training that some of my colleagues have. Um, and perhaps uh, feel a little um, inadequate sometimes without Outgun. having taken contracts or, um, you know, constitutional law. Okay. You said as a reporter, you, you're one of your mentors, and not, it's not a mentor, but someone that you appreciate, someone from Baltimore, H.L. Mencken, 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 I never say it correctly, Mencken. Comfort the afflicted, afflict the comfortable. That's your, is that right? Uh, you know, actually, I looked up that quote, and I think it's not a Minkin original quote. But, um, but yes, right. that is a little bit of my approach. Mary and this Barry. This is like, speed, like yes. speed questioning. Well, there are things I want to ask you, but I'm waiting to wear you out. You ran for the council in 2013, you lost, you came in second. You ran in 2014, Marion Barry endorsed you. Why? Well, he wrote a fabulous uh, letter, um, but he basically said, if I remember correctly, that he thought that I would represent uh, the residents of Ward 8 the best. And uh, that he believed in, that uh, I would always make the right decisions for the residents he cared the most about the least, the last, and the lost. Did you go to the Washington Post directly from being loose lips? Uh, there was a maybe a four month interim. Okay, because Mary and Barry also told you you made a mistake going to the Post. Tell Josh that Gibson, story. I think Tom is listening to our your radio program. I did. I'm going to give him credit <laughs> in a moment. Um, there, so there's the a, I'll, I'll give credit before Tom does. So there's a great um, up, Josh. radio program on, uh, what is it, the channel, Josh? HD4, the city's channel. You can channel. get it online a lot easier. Than it's called um, Ask the Council, uh, Hearing the Council. And it's a treasure trove of information <laughs> about all the council members who thought no one would ever listen to these things. That is exactly right. Um, so uh, this was about Barry's. Barry told Barry you you, were, oh. you made a mistake going so to the post. So this is a great story. Yeah. So 
Um, so I'll, I'll be candid. Um, I left uh, City Paper not under the best circumstances. It was a teachable moment for you me. You fought I, with Eric Wimple, the editor. I did, but it was more like I let my personal life and my professional life collide in the in the worst way. You know, I had a personal disappointment that affected my decision making professionally and and then I let it impact some decisions that I made uh, as as loose lips and uh, not, I mean I won't be cryptic about it I think there was there we had a uh, disagreement over the baseball stadium actually uh, I wanted to write a piece for the Washington Post about the baseball stadium I can't remember exactly what and Eric disagreed and it led to my departure where does Eric Wimple work now he is a media columnist for the Washington Post. Uh, it's a check. very small town, folks. Yes, and we be and and actually, Eric is well, I would say a great mentor too. And uh, he, he and his wife Stephanie Mensimer, uh, who writes uh, for Mother Jones, terrific both terrific journalists and people I admire. So we we patched up the relationship, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for Eric. Uh, but uh, I ended up at the Post in the business section in Fairfax County. Not a good fit. <laughs> Not a good fit. I refused to get a car. Um, and as, as loose lips, she was known for riding, like Bill Rice, if you know of Bill Rice, of riding her bicycle all over town before I think there was any bike lanes. Before it was fashionable. Um, yes. I mean, I, one time I rode on Alabama. I, you know, there's a reason why bicycling is challenging east of the river. It's very hilly. I, if anyone has ever ridden on Alabama Avenue, which I did to get to some more eight Democrats meetings. Morris it, Road. It is. Yes. Morris is challenging too. Um, but yes, I, um, was out in Fairfax County. I was at the post at, uh, uh, what would we call it, uh, uh, PB, pre-Bezos. Um, so I was at the post at the worst time. Uh, just So it's 2005. Um, no one knew, you know, newspapers didn't know how to take advantage of the Internet. Uh, there was declining readership. Uh, they were closing bureaus. The post, I was at the post for four years. There were four empl employee buyouts in the four years I was there. It was a really difficult time to be there. Uh, and, but I learned a lot, of, uh, a lot of lessons from that time, which I'm going to keep my answer short, but if you would like to know what those lessons are, well, I'm Just give us like one of the top lessons of working there. I also worked there for uh, a yes. long time, but I don't have any lessons. Oh. I went to Channel 4 TV because I paid twice as much money. That's the reason I love. Well, I you were there in, in a great time at the yes. Post, and uh, you covered Barry. This is not about me, though. Oh, okay. I was trying to pivot a, a key uh, political skill. So, so the things learn? I learned is, you know, newspapers are political places. So I had a lot of advocates at the Post, and I didn't know how to take advantage of them. So the reason the Post hired me is because I went to all these crazy meetings that no Post reporter would ever go to. I would ride my bicycle all over town. Uh, I went to meetings that didn't seem that significant, and interesting things ended up happening there. Um, and But I didn't know how to take advantage, I, I think, of mentors was a key lesson. Uh, the, news, uh, the Post is a big bureaucracy, uh, and I didn't know how to maneuver within that a large organization uh, like the Post. I, I, um, I also um, realized something about myself, which is I wasn't a great beat reporter, uh, which I think might get to an issue you might talk about later, which is, um, you know, in order to be a good beat reporter, you have to be on top of the of the current story, of the zeitgeist, of what everyone's talking about. And I noticed over the years, especially as a council member, that when everyone's over here and talking about this, I'm thinking, hmm, who's being ignored over here? You know, what, what are the issues that are not being talked about? Who's being ignored? What are the great stories that haven't been found? And I think, um, you know, in the end, the lesson learned was I think it was a good thing that I didn't end up uh, spending more time at the post because I think it would have been a struggle. There's a new loose lips now at the city paper, Mitch Riles. He's from the West Coast. He's only been here since the first, like late last year, I guess, mm -hmm. very, just a few months. 
Um, have you talked to him? What is your, as a, an elected official, what is your relationship in talking to someone like Loose Lips or other reporters? How is it different since you were on the other side as a reporter? Mm. So have you met, have you talked to Mitch Riles yet? Uh, yeah, yes. Okay. About what? <laughs> so this came up actually, this is, uh, I met with some um, students from Murray earlier today and they were asking a similar question, which is, do you think you have a different relationship with reporters being a former reporter than your colleagues do? Is that the question you were trying to ask me? I'll yield, I'll yield to Murray. <laughs> There's some smart kids at that school. Um, so I, I think I have a different approach. And um, the, you know, I think our, your background informs you, informs people of who you are and, um, and your approach to things. Like uh, your question about Kathy, you know, I think we share a similar approach to being a legislator and approach to doing oversight and what we think the key uh, roles and responsibilities of a council member are. She's a former reporter. Right. Um, and so I understand that your role, Tom, is to report the news. And as I told the Murray students, um, the a famous editor at City Paper, um, who sadly isn't with us anymore, David Carr, would always explain news this way. Planes landing safely at National Airport, not news planes crashing news. News is what's unexpected. News is what's surprising. And so I think I have, appreci I have an appreciation uh, for what is considered news. And I think I have appreciation for the role of a reporter of helping the public understand what's going on in their government. Did you answer the question about Mitch Riles? Yeah, I said yes. I talked to him. That's, that's all. You told me not to go on and on with my answers. <laughs> okay. Is this fun for everyone? Are we doing a good job so far? Okay, good. Because I know you paid a lot of money to be here. It's a lot of time. Um, I've got so many notes here. I'm just going to try to get to important things. Why don't we get, get to audience questions? Because I'm the moderator. <laughs> So um, why did you become a council member? You were, you were a, an alternative, they used to call it alternative journalist. You went to the establishment post. Oh, that was the Great Barry story we skipped. Do you mind yes, if we go back to that? It depends on how long it is. So yeah, so I remember there are certain moments in your life, right, that you remember really clearly. And I had left um, you know, as I explained to you guys, I probably should have never left City Paper. And um, I went to the post. And I remember being on the fifth floor of the Wilson building where, uh, for those of you who've testified and thank you for testifying and being a participant in our government, um, there's a big district flag. And I remember Barry stopped me and he said, Silverman, I hear you went to the post. And I said, yes. And he said, that's a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, that's way too establishment for you. You're going to be miserable. And he was right. Um, yeah, you know, as I explained, I think that he was, uh, I think he had a great insight into sort of w why w the passions I had as a reporter. Um, but I think also, um, you know, but he, he was right for other uh, reasons he didn't realize. And I didn't Good. have the best experience. I've talked to council members and I've talked to people who are active in the council and talking about your style. They say that you are open to conversation. You're open to dialogue. You're open to new ideas. You're open to new kinds of information that you don't have. But you rarely change your mind that you are always, one said she's kind of like Betty Ann Cain. She thinks she's right. Betty Ann Cain was on the council. You remember this is one of the criticisms of her, that you just think you're right all the time. And it's, it's hard for people to get you to change your mind. Who, can you tell me a time when you felt strongly about something and changed your mind? Um, yeah, definitely. Like coming to this event, <laughs> yeah. talking to the 
or laugh oh, into the yes. mic. Okay. Um, so I think that I think we're presented with a lot of binary choices at the council. Uh, and I think there's often a uh, alternative approach or a different way of approaching it. And a recent example I'll give is, uh, do we renovate schools or do we uh, renovate and fix uh, the city's only indoor uh, ice arena? Um, and I don't think that's the correct choice or view. Uh, I think we, can, we have a $14 billion budget. We can do both. Um, to, I, I will say I do have a, a different approach perhaps than my colleagues in that when you come to meet with me, I'm not going to give you the answer that uh, even though I know where I am, I'm going to say, oh, that's an interesting idea or hmm, I'll think about that. If I have an opinion, I'm going to share it with you and then ask you for a reaction. Um, so I might have a different style, but I have changed my mind on, on certain issues. Um, for example, I went back and forth, I mean, a recent issue I can think about where I, where I went back and forth is on sports betting. And in the end, I thought that the choice that was presented. I'm going to get to sports betting. Oh, okay. Was, was this not, is more I thought there your, was an alternative choice. This is more of a personality test as opposed to a policy test. Oh, okay. Um, well, but I thought you were asking when I changed my mind on yes. the policy issue. Right. So it is a policy test. Welcome to the Alyssa Silverman world. <laughs> this is where I'll make the, the joke about genetic called me irritating. And uh, for those of you who are at the swearing in, you've heard this joke. But, you know, after Janetta wrote that uh, some of my colleagues call me irritating, I said, ah, you know, we should make sure it's like Alyssa Silverman irritating the D.C. Council since um, 2014, right. irritating the Silverman family since 1973. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, so I, I will answer your question. Actually, there are a few things and I'm trying to think it's actually one thing that I agree with um, Jack Evans on that I changed my mind. And now I can't. Oh, oh it's about the contracts, about the council. Um, Voting on, on contracts. All, now, all, so all, right all now, council. All million dollar right, contracts. So initially, I thought, no, the council shouldn't vote on con. Yeah, okay, here's a perfect example. Let me explain to him. Uh, so the council votes on contracts above a million dollars, and I thought, hmm. I don't. I think when I first ran, I thought, oh, they shouldn't do that. There David Grosso thinks that political vote meddling on and so forth. And now, actually, I realize, no, the council should vote on contracts. Um, because I think there's a, a lot that needs to be uh, looked at in the contracting process. And if we look at a lot of, um, uh, well, I'm especially interested right now in how we procure technology. I think we're really missing the boat in district government. In turn, I don't think we bring the uh, technology that we need to to bring services more efficiently to our residents. And I see John Capozzi uh, shaking his head up and down. Uh, but I do, you know, I, and we do take a lot, a look at contracts uh, very closely in my office. For example, one contract that I inserted myself uh, into the conversation about was United Medical Center. We were giving a contract to a contractor who was not providing um, adequate services at UMC. Uh, and we ended that contract, and that was the right thing to do. Given the personalities there, are, it's a very small world, 13 people. You have to have seven votes, yourself and six others, to pass something, nine if it's an emergency. What is it? Is there a progressive wing of the, of the council? In the past, and for many years, it's been that there's been what people call a floating majority. Depending on the issue, council members coalesce and break apart based on the issues. Do you find that that's true? And does your fight with one council member on issue X impede your ability to get along with that council member on Y? It's a very small world of council members. What so, is the group dynamic? Hmm. Um, Who do you I, hate the most? <laughs> so I will say one, one thing that I think I bring to debate is I don't personalize it. I don't hold, I think you would hear from count my colleagues that I don't hold grudges. You know, I, uh, um, you know, I disagree with council members, but I don't 
uh, hold it against them that they are in disagreement or we, we have an ideological difference. Um, so uh, what I would say is that I think there should be more ideological disagreements at the council. I'll be honest with you. I think it's too consensus driven. I think we have important decisions and challenges and sometimes there is a different way of approaching an issue and 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 I respect that you know people have a different approach than I do. I think people have seen your personality here challenging the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> but Let's go back to 2018, a horrific year for you, even though you won a re-election, the anti-Semitism of the spring, the fallout from that, Trayon White attempt to adjust to what he fell into. And just today you've seen on the national scale, congressional members, of, a con member of Congress has to apologize for what she said about Jewish people. I don't want to rehash the whole story, but you, you told in this council interview, you said that as a child, you said you were never bat mitzvahed, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Bat mitzvahed? You didn't go to Hebrew school, that your parents are not particularly religious, nor were you. You've been a little more active in the synagogue here. You're more observant now. Your public life, though, is always more than your Jewish identity, or it was. Last year, given the horrific events of the protests out in front of the Wilson building, um, had people talking about Jews as termites and you as a fake Jew. You met with Mayor Bowser privately. And she condemned anti-Semitism. But she also tried very publicly to defeat you through the candidacy of Dion Reeder. Again, without replaying the whole situation, where are we now? Have you and the mayor talked since you won about this issue, this overwhelming reelection, and what's happening and what's changed? Looking ahead as opposed to so much back. There's a lot, a lot in that. Talking to your microphone. Uh, I tried to summarize that just so people remember it, I think, well enough. But I'm thinking, where are we now is, is the context of the question. Uh, where are we now? We'll just start with the mayor. Have you okay. and the mayor had a heart-to-heart -heart discussion since that meeting at her house? The mayor and I have had a uh, conversation after the election. Yep. Can you characterize that conversation? Do you, are you in, encouraged by it, inspired by it, worried by it? The election's over, Tom, and now we move on to governing. Uh, and that's my approach in that uh, we have some really big challenges in our city. Um, we have a city that most people find unaffordable in terms of housing. Uh, we have an achievement gap that is gaping and that we need to close. And uh, we have public safety challenges. We have gun violence in our city that is just heartbreaking. Uh, and that's what we need to focus on, not on personality differences or on what happened in the election. But we won't talk about the election. Let's talk about hate speech. Hate, okay. hate, hate crimes, hate incidences are around the country are up. Many people thought that what happened last year in, in the, uh, the way you were treated and, and some black people think, the way you treat them, uh, what's terrible. It's, I don't think people called it hate, but some of it was. And I'm just wondering, the council stood out, all 13 members, I think, stood out in front of the council and denounced, I think the chairman denounced hatred. But has the city moved beyond it? Has something good happened that we should know? Are we still waiting? I don't think the mayor had her, had her big public event that she and Brianne Nadeau talked about doing to publicly lead the city into a new direction. Did that ever happen? Did I miss it? Um, so I think there's a lot. I'm giving you one more chance to talk <laughs> about this subject. I felt very strong. So um, what happened in the spring, there, a lot of things happened. And I think we don't want to confuse uh, events. Um, I think that uh, what you're focused on is the, there, there was a rally that I think was presented as a uh, act of unity, but actually uh, was a very 
divisive event right. in the end, um, in which some very hateful things were said. Uh, and I think that we need to be unified against hate and hate speech in our city. And what's um, being done about that? Uh, so w it is a work in progress, I will say. Um, in fact, um, I will say that um, there is a speaker, uh, some of you might be going to Sixth and I um, this week to see Deborah Lipstadt, who is one of the former most experts on anti-Semitism. Um, and I will say this, uh, and that she'll be uh, meeting with the council actually um, to talk about the history of anti-Semitism. Did you week. set that up? Yes, I did. Good. Has there been any other thing more more devastating to you personally? And I'm going to come moving on after this question. Has there been anything more devastating personally to you than what happened in 19 last year, in 2018, in your public life? You know, uh, so I actually so um, hate speech is horrific. I agree with you, uh, but I think having conversations about. Uh, who we are uh, as a, a diverse group of people in the city are important conversations to have. Um, I mean, what frustrated, uh, so I'll be candid, what frustrated me um, is that um, part of the divisiveness was there was an attempt to say that I was not supportive of my colleague, Tran White which was just a complete mis mischaracterization. And that's what I have to, I mean, the, the hate speech, um, it is, um, is disturbing and certainly destructive. Um, but what was personally um, very um, demoralizing for me is that actually after um, the conversation about uh, Tran's remarks, I invited him to Six and I, and I want to credit Six and I for being uh, open uh, and welcoming for Passover. Um, Treyon and I probably vote uh, more uh, alike than any other two members, uh, and we share a common agenda, and I consider Treyon to be a, a, an ally, yet there was an attempt uh, to make us, uh, to, to, to frame to me as an enemy. Yes, to wedge and, between and, you. And, I can say, and, and the reason I felt so strongly about condemning that rally and the leaders of it, um, Josh Lopez, is because I can tell you, Tom, that the divisiveness uh, is something in the relationships, the, the framing that I was not an ally of trans is something I'm still trying to repair to this day. There are many residents of Ward 8 who think that I am not an ally, that um, I am uh, an adversary of putting money into programs that help uh, working people in Ward 8. And I mean, if you just look at my political record, that couldn't be uh, farther from the truth. You, you and uh, Tryon White also appeared at the Kenyon McDuffie's Racial Equity Forum mm -hmm. in Ward 8. And, you, and I noted that when you got up, there was very little applause. But after you had what you had to say, there was fairly good applause when you sat down. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Well, I noticed. Uh, thank you for those words in the city paper. Um, I, I very carefully read your journalism. Um, but uh, but that's what, that's, uh, that is what disturbs me so much, is that we are a city with great challenges uh, in racial equity. We are. Uh, the income of a black household is $80,000 lower than the average income of white households in this city. Um, the educational outcomes of black students is much different than the educational outcomes of white students. And I just don't think pitting uh, one group of people against another is the way that we actually solve uh, and, and, and come toward solutions um, to these very serious challenges. Uh, I think we have to work together as a community to answer your question again. So yes, I, I uh, work to I'm work to bring um, Deborah Lipstad. I'm also talking with uh, various communities to think about doing something similar to what we did at Passover, which is, and I actually wanted to bring snacks for all of you, and I didn't have time to do that because I think when you sit down and you break bread with people, it's different than going to a community meeting. Uh, That's a good point to ask a question. Oh, uh, did you okay. finish? Did you? 
Quick, so I we only have 15 more minutes. So I got 22 questions. Well, I kept my answers very short at yes. the beginning. My, that's what you but did. But this well. is an important thing, Tom. I, I, I just that's why I, brought it up. I, I felt I felt that the politics of uh, pitting uh, one group of residents against another is just really it is really destructive to our city, and I wanted to speak out very strongly against Thank that. Thank you for taking that up a little bit further than you sure. wanted to. So this is a good segue. Why do you think the Washington Post editorial page, what do you think the Washington editorial page has against you? Well, you'd have to ask the Washington Post editorial page. Um, you know, I think that they are not fans of paid family leave. Um, uh, I used to have a really good answer for this during the campaign, I'm out of practice. Um, you know, I am an advocate for working families in our city and for bringing the resources uh, needed uh, to support working families. And um, they very specifically disagree with some of those policies. A couple of these questions are about schools, but I'm going to just lump it all together and say that once again, we're back in the aspirational stage of schools. We have a new chancellor, Louis Farabee. Have you met with him? And have you heard anything more than aspirational talk? I have met with Dr. Farabee and we'll be having our uh, council hearing at the Wilson building on his confirmation tomorrow. Um, so I'm looking for, and I, my conversation with uh, Dr. Farabee was, uh, I am looking for a few things in the new chancellor. Uh, as we talked about, um, it is not a simple thing to close the achievement gap, um, but I want to understand where Dr. Fair, what Dr. Farabee's plan uh, and and tools will be to do that. Uh, I also think that we need to have a real school system in our city, uh, not two separate systems, not a game of chance. Uh, it, it, which is what we have um, in the lottery. Uh, I, I think we, I want to understand how he is going to support uh, and um, bring to their full potential all the schools in our city. Um, you know, I don't like the term underperforming schools. I just don't. I think it's schools where the kids haven't, you know, reached their academic potential yet. Um, but I, I uh, want to understand what mechanisms and what tools he's going to use to um, make sure that those schools are as high performing as, as every school in the city. Does, does he have children? If so, do you know which schools they'll be going to? He which does have. He does Saint have Antoine children. Wilson. Um, I'm not sure if his family. I don't think his family has moved here from Indianapolis yet. But I do know. I think he. I. I I know he has children. Okay, you mentioned sports betting earlier. You voted the, uh, at the council in the first vote, seven to six vote, on not allowing this, the CFO to go forward with the, the current lottery contractor to create sports betting. Um, there's another vote on the 19th. Do you anticipate any change in that, or do you expect sports betting to go forward? And as the CFO says, we'll have sports betting in the city by the time football season gets here are you working to defeat sports betting and to have competitive contract bidding as opposed to the current contractor interlot just getting the contract uh, i don't see a lot of change in the council uh vote on the 19th um let me i mean so let me tell you uh some things that are illuminating to me as a council or some things about why would anyone here care about sports betting? I mean, maybe you have a moral opposition to the lottery or to uh, gambling, but what was truly interesting about sports betting is it really was a window into how we do contracting in our city. Um, in that uh, sports betting attracted the interest of all the biggest lobbyists um, and uh, political players in our city because they uh, profit off of sports betting. Um, and I you know I don't want to go on and on, but uh, I know. Uh, but it, it's, it was a fascinating window into who benefits from public policy. Um, and a lot of times it is uh, some very politically connected people 
who benefit the most. There are like 10 or 12 people who would like a piece of sports betting. And if we go with a single contractor, they won't get in. Well, you know, who's going to benefit uh, first from sports betting is going to be Ted Leonsis, right? Uh, and some of you might have read a New York Times uh, story that he's sort of that uh, – that framed him as sort of the proselytizer of sports betting. Um, so, so what we did, just for uh, those who might not have been following the issue, is the Supreme Court uh, ruled. Wait, wait, wait! wait. I, I don't want to oh. go into that much detail about oh, you don't sports want that? betting. Okay. No, because I want to talk about well, in the, the Redskins. End, well, well, I, let me say uh, to, um, to wrap up sport. In the end, you know, rich people are going to be made richer, and the que and the question for me is how is how are district residents going to benefit? Um, and to make sure that the uh, process is one in which you as residents have confidence in. Every, ma every mayor since Tony Williams has sought to bring the, the, the Washington football team, the Skins, back to town under a circumstance. Each one of them has said the team would build the stadium, whatever it cost. The city would prepare the land just like it did for the Verizon Center, the Capital One Center. It would not be a baseball paid stadium, which a lot of people didn't like. Are you even willing to discuss with the team, bringing the team back to the city at the RFK site? It's assuming, well, not assuming, the team will build its own stadium, but what about the name? Where are you in that general conversation? Every mayor since Tony Williams has been working to do this. Well, I've said repeatedly, change the name, change the owner. Oh, okay, we're all against the owner. I actually thought we could probably get away with saying we won't change the name if we can change the owner. Then we'd change the name once we got a new owner. But he seems to be stuck there. So you, you'd be willing to discuss this team if he changed the name? Well, as, as uh, my colleague said, I'm always willing to discuss. Um, Never change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, See how that all that comes is, back. Uh, I don't want to spend one penny on uh, a stadium not a uh, stadium on the land to develop well i mean you know infrastructure costs can end up being a lot of money and yes. you know this is all about what are our priorities as a city you know where are we going to spend those capital dollars are we going to you know are we going to spend it on uh on programs or non facilities that are going to enrich our residents or are going to enrich an nfl owner uh, I think that's the key question. A Poland gets credit for $180 million for him building the original arena. The city at that time, though, spent $120 million preparing the land, moving part of the metro system, getting rid of the buildings, all of that, and also gave him $50 million later to refurbish it. So the city was fully involved with the arena, even though a lot of people don't think so. But let's move on to lots of school is other issues. Sorry, my notes. Campaign ethics. Are you guys still enjoying this? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, uh, just I, checking in. I'm just leaving these issues at the end. Constituent your, services. Your personal um, story is, is the point of why you're here. You've told it very well. Campaign ethics. You've supported public financing of campaigns. You don't accept donations from corporations and PACs. Is that right? I only accept money from individuals. Only from individuals. Um, has the city done enough with the latest legislation passed out of Charles Allen's committee and ethics? To, do you want more ethics reform? If so, what? Well, it'd be great if we are all just really ethical. Um, but uh, I think that we have some game changing legislation in two things. I think the um, legislation that was passed uh, in December, um, which will uh, limit contractor contributions. Um, is going to be significant. Uh, I also think public financing is going to be a true game changer in our city. Uh, it is a different um, approach to campaign finance than when I, when I ran in 2013. I, I uh, said I'm not going to accept money from um, corporations and I'm not going to accept PAC money, which I have to say the labor unions weren't thrilled about. Um, and everyone thought I was nuts absolutely crazy um, and it was the best decision I've ever made paid, paid family leave there's a, a council hearing coming up on paid family leave I don't think it's your committee right but there's some type of hearing where the, the taxes are 
being collected for paid family leave or starting in July? What okay. is, what's the status of this groundbreaking uh, thing that you supported? So paid family leave is law. We are implementing the law. And on July 1, according right. to the law, we should have a tax system in place that will be able to, that employers will be able to start making contributions. Also on July 1, the minimum wage in the city goes to $14 mm -hmm. on its way to 15 um, Do you anticipate you'll see a minimum wage change in other states? There seems to be lots of cha changes. Well, I think there was just a study completed in Seattle that showed um, that, in fact, the minimum wage increase uh, led to um, you know a growing economy in right. Seattle and that all of the chicken little arguments that uh, there are going to be deleterious effects to the um, business community have just not proven to be true. And Virginia continues to use at $7.25, which is the federal minimum wage. No one can live on that. Most well, I mean, it's so, you know, if you remember back uh, at the smoking ban, all the restaurants were going to move to Virginia. Good. And then when we raised the minimum wage to 11 25 uh, all the restaurants were going to move to Virginia. Now, I look at Barracks Row, I look at Shaw, I look downtown, I look at the wharf, and I see a whole lot of restaurants in the district uh, and a whole lot of retailers. Uh, we have, you know, a gr we're still under retailed in certain parts of our city, certainly east of the river, um, but I see uh, growing retailers. The reason why we don't have more retailers is because of, I think, uh, commercial rents, but not because of the minimum wage. This, this person says, thank you for creating, opening up public toilets for homeless people. What's that about? Very briefly, what's that uh, about? That's a, so credit goes really to Brianne Nadeau, my Ward 1 colleague, uh, who uh, had legislation to pilot uh, public toilets. It's very difficult uh, when you are homeless um, to use a bathroom. And this is, I think, other cities have experimented with this. Also, it's just difficult sometimes when you just aren't familiar with the city. Uh, and you really need to go. <laughs> so um, this is, I think they're common in uh, Europe and um, it's a good approach um, to making uh, bathrooms accessible to everybody. This person, a couple of statehood questions. What's the latest update on the situation for DC statehood? Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton has introduced it in the House, has been introduced in the Senate. Prospects for passing in the House. The, the speaker said there's gonna be a hearing. How optimistic are you that, I know you want it to happen, but how optimistic are you that something might, ha might happen? So I, um, I think we have some great advocates uh, who have worked really hard, and I think we need to focus more on a city on statehood. Uh, we need to persuade every uh, Democrat um, in the House and in the Senate to support statehood, and I think we need to make a focus of the 2020 elections in terms of who we're going to support. Uh, we should make, uh, whenever I go to a fundraiser for a congressional candidate, I can think of um, the candidate who ran in Virginia, the first um, Virginia one, uh, Van, uh, gosh, I can't think of Vandy's last name, but um, I went to a camp, someone invited me to a campaign event. I said, I'm happy to go. And um, in her remarks, she said, I support DC statehood. I wrote her a check. Okay. Are you pro catnip? <laughs> I do not use catnip, actually. How many litter boxes do you have? I have one. Okay. Four didn't work for me. All right. So when you were in Providence, did you cover Buddy Cianci? Is that how you say his name? Buddy Cianci? And if so, what was he like? Uh, I have a picture of Buddy Cianci in my office. Um, uh, so Buddy, say briefly who he is. He uh, was a uh, mayor of Providence, a little controversial. Uh, like so Barry? Ma very similar to Marion Barry. Um, he, um, I think, was indicted twice. Uh, first for, I think, he beat up his wife, uh, had an affair, and he used his police detail to uh, send a message, let's say, to, uh, to uh, her um, lover. Um, okay and was uh, removed from office after that. And then the second time, uh, if you read the New, the New Yorker has a great story, he was set up. Um, so uh, Cianci was, um, I think, found on a RICO, uh, uh, guilty of a RICO charge. 
corruption charge involving, this is a great story. Is anyone from Providence? It's 8 o'clock. Okay, is anyone from Providence? Oh, no one's from Providence. Okay. Is he alive or dead? He is he dead. He died, I believe, a year well, ago. Hold, but there's a great story time. So he was um, convicted of giving a zoning, or, or denying a zoning variance to this blue blood club called the Providence Club that didn't let Buddy in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And um, it was like, I mean, it, it had, there was a whole FBI investigation of his administration called Operation Plunderdome. Um, but, you know, uh, the, I think he was convicted on a conspiracy and the conspiracy was denying, uh, I think it was called like the, the, the Providence Club or something, a zoning variance. In the end. Uh, back to your style. Uh, how do you withhold judgment? about other council members when the differences aren't ideological but simply monetary. This person says others are bought by developers and make a lot of money. How can you respect those positions that are driven by greed? So when you really think someone is being unethical or not unethical but a, a terrible position, how do you withhold having personal judgment? Because you might need their vote sometime down the line? Um. So that is part of my style. Um, you know, people have different approaches and different priorities as council members, and I don't, I don't judge people on that. I really don't. Um, I disagree with them. I don't think it's a good policy. I don't think it serves our residents well. But I don't. Um, I, I'm not personally judgmental about that. A uh, very quickly, summer jobs. Your committee, workforce development, oversees summer jobs. Some years it's been ter terrible. In recent years, it's been pretty good. What's that prospect? Because jobs as housing are very important for young people. What are you anticipating for summer jobs this year from what you've seen so far? We want to make, I, I want to make sure that every uh, young person has a great experience in our summer youth employment program. It's a storied program that was started by Mayor Barry. Uh, and I, I don't think it's... It, it's the, the experience is uneven. Some people have life-changing experiences in the summer youth employment program that really put them on a, a trajectory of, of great professional success. You meet them across the city, people who... Yeah, I yeah. mean, um, you know, for many people, it was their first job, it was their second job. Uh, it connected them to professional mentors. That's the way it should be for every single participant in SYEP. Um, SYEP. What, in the summer youth employment Thank program. You. And I want to make sure that, uh, so I don't really care what uh, our young people do in the program, but I want to make sure they're endowed with certain habits and skills that are really critical and I hear from employers are the big obstacle to a lot of our young people getting employment. And they are things that you think might be very basic, but they're critical. Show up on time. Yes knowing how to communicate, knowing how to deal with conflict, uh, knowing how to be resilient, uh, how to handle life's obstacles. I, I, these are things that are very are challenging for all of us. Uh, but, uh, and I think the Summer Youth Employment Program has a unique opportunity to help our young people with those skills. Attorney General Carl Racine endorsed you, appeared in your ads, spoke on your behalf, as did others. Do you think he'd make a good mayor? I think he'd make a terrific attorney general of the United States, to be honest. I, I think what about, Carl, now, what about mayor? Um, so I don't, I think he would be a good mayor, but I, I, I have to tell you, and I mean this in all sincerity, Carl is, is spectacular. He's a spectacular person. I think he's a spectacular uh, mind. Uh, and I think his, uh, he has a unique uh, combination of compassion. Uh, I, he is driven. I have received a phone calls from him. Uh, once I received a phone call from him at like 5.30 in the morning on an issue. Um, that dealt with actually the program that has been piloted and very successful called Cure Violence, Cure the Streets. Um, I gave uh, help, uh, helped in coalition with uh, colleagues uh, find money for that program. Uh, but I, I really think, uh, I, I admire Carl so much and, and um, 
I consider Carl a mentor as well. Uh, he is just a, a, a unique uh, talent in this city. Uh, a lot of people don't know that he, uh, so he, his family fled uh, the Duvalier regime in Haiti, but he, he grew up here since he was two. Um, he is a son of the city and he's really a spectacular public servant. I, I can't say enough about him. So we're out of time, but uh, Jack Evans, a War II council member and longtime serving member, the Finance and Revenue Chairman, says he wants you to go to, to more, if not the first, Board of Trade. And you said you can't go to their annual dinner, but she said you can't go unless you bought some new clothes. Oh, no. So Jack <laughs> always says, so a lot of people don't know, you know, you think, oh, Silverman and Evans are so uh, ideologically different. They must not get along at all. Actually, Jack and I go out for drinks every few months. Um, and he tells me, Alyssa, you don't go to enough black tie events. And I said, well, that's easy for you because you just have one tuxedo. Like I have to wear different outfits all the time. Maybe I'm a little frugal. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't know, I need to visit Rent the Runway or something like that. Um, but I actually have been asking for uh, Jack to get me into the Economic Club of, of Washington, D.C. for like a few years now. And he's still waiting for the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, Alyssa Silverman.